International Virtual University. It's uh, Professor Naveed Sayyid, who will be introduced by my colleague, Dr. Nadeem Akhtar, sitting in Birmingham to the audience. But welcome, Naveed, once again, to the platform of Sadiq International Virtual University. We're all here to listen to your expertise. You're a master crafter. You're a top scientist. You are really one of the icons. I That's can't think of anybody better than you. Icon of IMI and Steve. Welcome and over to Nadeem. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. A very well warm welcome to everyone to this uh, webinar, Pusham Deed. Um, uh, I can firmly assure all of you that this is going to be a very exciting hour ahead of us um, because I don't just think that we are just privileged or, or honored. I truly believe that we are blessed uh, to have Professor Sayyid with us. Um, a very brief uh, introduction, obviously, because we would like to hear him. He, um, Professor Sayyid is a scientific director uh, Alberta Children's Hospital Research Institute, University of Calgary, Canada. Uh, he has truly many feathers uh, in his cap of uh, academic and scientific research. Uh, he's a recipient of many, and the word many is truly correct here, uh, many national and international awards, uh, including Tamra Mtiaz. Uh, which is the highest uh, civilian award for the research from government of Pakistan. Uh, he's also a recipient of a Senate of Canada uh, 150th anniversary medal, and the list goes on. Uh, but one of the most interesting things uh, that attracted the world uh, is his uh, and his team research uh, about uh, the bionic hybrid uh, which enabled the dialogue between the brain cells uh, and the silicon chip. Uh, and being a neurologist, uh, I can tell you how excited the community of uh, neurosciences was, uh, and no wonder the exciting uh, aspects were, were picked up by the lay press and the news channels all over the world, including the Time magazine. Um, he's the first scientist to perform a single cell brain cell transplant uh, in a living animal. Um, the list doesn't stop here, uh, but we are all here to uh, hear his words. But before I just uh, introduce uh, the topic of today's, which is the Alzheimer's a pandemic and waiting, uh, I was going to this, uh, one of the share, one of the couplet of Ghalib, uh, who says, Ke dil mein zoke vasn. This is the pandemic, this is a fire uh, that we would be going to talk about, which is the Alzheimer's disease, uh, a pandemic in waiting. So I uh, humbly request Professor Sayyid for, for, and hand over the mic to him. Um, Dr. Nadeem, thank you for that kind introduction. I still really uh, hold very close to my memory uh, hippocampal chamber, the time that I spent also on your, on your program. And you were, you were still really doing such a tremendous service. Uh, your programs are so well uh, watched and so informative and um, I really um, um, indebted to you on behalf of the entire community for what you do uh, outside of your own immediate really uh, you know, job. So you consider this as a noble cause and you do it so well. So bless you. And I still remember the wonderful time that I had when we shared the podium. So today I think uh, the topic is a little bit, I'll share my screen as uh, Dr. Nadim pointed out, I'm also indebted to Dr. Um, Shabiul Hassan, who is always so kind and gracious uh, to provide me with this opportunity to really connect um, and the job that they are doing for these webinars and seminars. And hopefully, you know, very soon, a physical presence is really impeccable. And I think uh, it's uh, really kudos to all of you. So, um, Dr. Nadim, um, thank you again. And you know, as if if I were to walk into your office and you 
had told me, and you are a neurologist, mashallah, yourself. And if you had told me that, um, you know, there is a maybe a leaky pipe in my room right now, or there is a wire that doesn't work. Um, can you fix it? So as a physician or as a neurologist or a neurosurgeon or as a doctor, um, I would say to you, um, yes, sir, I could help you, but perhaps if you could give me the line uh, drawings or the schematics of this room, I might be able to help. Um, but then your answer to me would have been, sorry, this room was built long before I was here. So there's not much um, that I have in my possession to give it to you. And then my next question to you would have been, uh, do you have hammer and a chisel that I can break through the drywall or the wall to be able to see where things might be because I don't want to really puncture or blow up a gas line. So your answer again to me would have been, sorry, I don't have any tools uh, or chisel or hammer to help you. So you wouldn't expect me to then use my really nail to dig through the wall. And I think this is, you know, would have been nicer for you to be present here when this room was being built. Um, and then you could do your own drawings and draw up all the maps. And if a problem occurred, we could go and fix this. So the same situation really applies to all neurological disorders and diseases because we don't know how things were put together in the first place. That is a biggest challenge. And the other thing is that if something goes wrong, we don't really have proper tools to be able to fix it because we don't understand how this uh, thing kind of, you know, came together and came to being. So half of us are really developing those tools that we can use to go and see the problem and fix it. The other half is trying to find out how this thing was put together in the first place. So this really is a situation for all neurological disorders and diseases. We only manage those patients, but there really is no, no treatment. So Alzheimer's disease, um, as the topic is really a pandemic in the waiting, and I think we know with aging population, people are living much longer lives. And as a result, we are infested with this terrible disease, which really is going to affect just about everybody and everything. And when I was discussing this one time, um, you know, earlier I got married that I would like to sort out neurological diseases, you know, and Alzheimer's. And my wife would say, well, what is Alzheimer's disease? I said, you know, um, when you forget to uh, really pay your bills and all those kinds of things, you forget to do this, you forget to do this. And she said, well, I have already diagnosed that you have that disease because you forget to pay bills <laughs> and do your things. So I think um, what I'm going to do today with your um, permission and liberty is to um, really talk about I give you an overview of what this talk is going to be about. I will really, uh, first of all, uh, talk about brain development. So this is where we are going to watch how the things come together um, when the thing or the room in that case was being put together. Um, and then we will talk about neural networks. Uh, so if somebody could really approve these people joining in, then I won't have to, I won't have to click. Um, a brain development and neuronal network assembly, how it comes together. What are the factors, both intrinsic and extrinsic outside that influence this wiring, a brain wiring? Um, and what is mindfulness and brain health? Because these are the two of the most important cornerstones and the fundamental building blocks that give us our personal identity. And this is something that is lost in Alzheimer disease as well. So how do we know what we know about brain function and its dysfunction? This is, we will also talk about the, um, in a little bit of detail, citing a few clinical presentations as well. Then the, how do brain cells communicate? And this is really is an important aspect because it's the brain communication that really gets um, you know, messed up. And because brain cells communicate through synapses or synaptic structures, it's really um, important to understand how they function or how they operate in, in that sense. So 
And then finally, we will talk about Alzheimer disease and how it manifests itself and how we might be able to remedy um, or, you know, the things that are on the horizon that we decided at the next pandemic. So in a developing fetus, brain is the fastest growing organ in a human body. It, you can imagine that there are more brain cells um, than there are stars in the Milky Way. Um, and we also know that um, you could put a 30,000 uh, brain cells at the tip of a single needle. And brain is the fastest growing organ in the human body. And the rate at which really comes together is just absolutely incredible. And when a baby is born, baby actually has twice the number of brain cells than what it would be left with soon after birth. So half of the brain cells are really killed during early uh, program cell death. So the question really is how does brain grow so much? It grows because of its you know, processes elaborating and its connectivity, and that is absolutely incredible. There are 30 to 40,000 synapses that are formed every second in a child's brain during um, you know, soon after birth. So it's really important to figure out how this thing comes together. So if things go wrong, we might be able to figure it out. Um, so this is something that's really important. And what we have learned over the years that when you look at brain and its, its components, its constituents, one begins to realize that it is really the fundamental building blocks are neurons. These are the brain cells and these brain cells are then connected through specialized structures through which brain cells talk to each other and we call them synapses. And when these synapses are formed between a network of brain cells, that really comprises the neuronal circuits. And these neuronal circuits are the one that give us the really the reason and the cause for everything that we do. And this is where all the default or the faults will occur that will create or leave the brain wiring as haywired and thus leading to cognitive decline, um, autism spectrum disorder, um, schizophrenia, bipolar, mental disorders, and it will also lead to many neurological diseases um, that are really the part of um, you know, uh, what we will talk about today. So we know that the genetic and the environmental factors, they change our brain circuits all the time and throughout our life. And this is something important to know, the brain circuits are not static, they are highly, highly, uh, really plastic and they change all the time. So even after this um, webinar, if you stayed awake, you would have gotten several thousand new connections in your brain and this will facilitate your learning memory and your cognitive functions. And these are the functions that are the potential, the sites that are the potential targets for all neurological diseases and particularly the Alzheimer disease where the brain actually circuits begin to fall apart. So we know that during development, brain cells that fire together, they wire together. If they don't fire uh, together, they will not wire together. So this is where the faulty lining or the, um, you know, um, uh, even pipelines or in that particular room that I cited earlier, are um, gas lines or you have, um, you know, um, wiring will go haywire if things are not connected properly. You have short circuits and this will allow brain to undergo really developmental uh, disorders or developmental diseases as well. So brain cells that fire apart, they will end up wiring apart. They will do not really fire uh, in, in sync, they will, they will actually fall out of the link. Um, so this is something that's really important uh, for us to also know that brain cells or the brain networks are really important and they are formed during early development. And if this developmental pattern is altered, I'll give you an example. If you have a kitty cat that's born, you put one patch over one of its eye um, and then you remove that patch a few days later, this kitty cat will be blind in that eye for life because those brain cells that require sensory inputs and allows to connect to your visual cortex, 
they are no longer actually a recipient of this firing patterns because there's no feedback coming from the eye or the no sensory input is coming from the eye. So it's important to know that neurons that fire together, they wire together. So firing together is not just a developmental issue, but also during neurodegenerative diseases, particularly during Alzheimer's disease, brain cells begin to really, circuits begin to fall apart and then the neurons fall apart and then they are were the ones serving cognitive function, learning and memory, that learning and memory also falls apart. So this is something to really keep in mind and that circuits are really important. And we know that during early developmental stages, if a child or a baby, here are the two uh, brain scans of two, um, four years old. And on the left side, you see a child who is really nurtured and had a loving environment, caring, loving, and provided with all kinds of stimulus that will activate his brain and brain region. And the right-hand side child is actually somebody who has undergone extreme neglect, abuse, um, isolation, and also punishment. You know, all the, the rough things in the life not loved, not cared. And these experiments we have done also on rats as well, where a mother that licks his pup, they are good learners. If a mother doesn't lick his pup, they are poor learners. So if you switch them around, they become good or bad learner. So in addition to the genetic makeup, the epigenetic or the environmental factors also play a very important role. And I'm showing this example particularly because once the big brain begins to degenerate uh, due to Alzheimer's disease, if it is not provided with an enriched environment and continue to stimulate this, it cannot hold this brain, uh, you know, the wealth of brain connectivity together and it begins to fall apart and begins to degenerate. This is something also to really remember. So another really unique attributes of a adult or grown up, even in a youth brain is the mindfulness. And what does brain do for us? It notices the details all around us. This is something that's very important to know. And then being present here and right now. So often we call these, if that only that person, uh, that function of the brain um, is enacted, you become a solipsist, but these people lose their identity. They just think about themselves. So being present right here and right now and thinking before acting or speaking. When the thinking process is perturbed, your speaking ability will also be perturbed. So this is where the circuits begin to fall apart and then paying attention to how your body is feeling and responding. So I think the self-awareness or consciousness this is also what we define as mindfulness. And these examples are being cited because this is where Alzheimer's disease hits us the hardest. We begin to lose our self-identity and then the words do not come together coupled and paired with our thinking. So what, how do we define really brain health that is perturbed or altered or affected in situations such as the Alzheimer's disease? is the interpretation of senses and the control of movement. And then the control of movement is also altered in other neurodegenerative diseases, such as the Parkinson's. Then you have mental and emotional processing. You've seen often people who are inflicted with, um, you know, um, Alzheimer's disease and are put on medications that are affecting particularly the cholinergic pathway you could see that it affects their mental and emotional processing quite considerably, um, and they end up with really um, mental um, um, and emotional processing is perturbed. And then the maintenance of normal behavior and social cognition is also a trait of a healthy brain that will really maintain a behavior which is congruent with the social paradigm or the social situation and the cognition uh, functions. So how do we know that in a disease condition that these are really the roles that are played by our brain? How do we know that which particular part of the brain, which particular area of the brain really performs which function? And we learn this from many disease conditions. So here is a clinical uh, case whereby John, an individual, he thought that 
he was pregnant. Um, and we know that the patients, they, they typically display an inappropriate lack of concern or, or, or emotions in proportional to the gravity of their symptoms or in response to others' concern for their disability. So John had a little bit of pot belly and he ended up in hospital. And he began to thought that people who have big bellies or protruding you know, uh, bellies, and they are generally pregnant and they will end up in a hospital for baby to be delivered. So he actually thought that he was, he was um, pregnant. And these kinds of conditions are often very difficult to really pick up by uh, you know, the physicians. Um, and it is, a, a, you know, it is, we know that adrenal uh, leukodystrophy, which is white matter damage, um, and he thought that he was pregnant. So his GPS in the brain that allows us to have that social and emotional component of the element or our brain and mental health component of so our self-awareness, which normally allows us to see and understand you know, our relative location in time and space, it went faulty. And so his GPS was really messed up and his brain could not really recognize. So, so we, you know, when you uh, probe these patients, you could find out that it is really a disability of his, um, you know, typically of his white matter in his brain. And that white matter area was damaged, either demyelinated or other shredded due to some um, illnesses. So we know certain diseases that manifest as a result of a damage to a particular part of the brain. Then we have Janet and she would be defined as soul blind or soul blindness. She has anexnosia, which is the lack of knowledge, not really knowing where you are. And she lost her vision, but she wouldn't admit. So if you presented her with something, um, a hand or ask her how many fingers, she will make it up. And, and, and if you told her, try to convince her that this is not what it is, she would not believe you. Um, so th at that situation, in those conditions, her soul basically has become blind and she has lack of knowledge or self-awareness that we talked about was really lost. And then Katie had stroke and she would uh, put up makeup on only one side of her face. And she did not believe that her left hand belonged to her. So, you know, when you have stroke in that particular case, certain parts of the brain are really, uh, the, the brain network or the wiring is disconnected. So only half a person uh, is there and you become really half a person. So that's something that is really important also for us to know because this is how we figure out what uh, are the underlying causes. So our beliefs oftentimes are so powerful they can shatter our reality and they can always replace it with an alternative ones. So brain is really powerful. So oftentimes, you know, I give you an example personally of my mother um, and, and I could figure out when I visited Pakistan, I could see that she was becoming forgetful um, and quite extensively. And at times she will have these lapses where she wouldn't even um, you know, know who I was or who was in the room and what was her relationships and relatives um, as well. And that was a bit concerning to me. So I took her to a local physician, a neurologist, very well known um, in Lahore. And then he tested my mother. And when he tested her, it turned out that she was absolutely perfectly rocked. She knew just about everything and she spat it out. And at that time, I was really flabbergasted as well. I said, you know, this can't be true. Um, so immediately occurred to me that oftentimes our brain has what we call as cognitive reserve. That cognitive reserve, often you've seen uh, bikes in Pakistan where people really tilt their bike to get, you know, squeeze a few drops of uh, gas or petrol to get it you know, to where they need to go. So that cognitive reserve in, the, in her brain allowed her to really recapitulate aspects of her memory with exquisite accuracy. So at the moment that occurred to me that she is really having a cognitive reserve um, which needs to be shattered, I took her the very next day back 
And when the physician tested her, neurologist tested her again, it turns out she just faltered. So many a time, these patients who are suffering from Alzheimer's disease, they can really fool us when, we, um, when they are presented to physicians or clinicians because of the cognitive reserve. And then the physician talks back to family and says, you know, I tested the skills for her age, um, you know, cognitive functions, and she seems to be performing really well. I don't think there is any need. Six months pass, and then we reach a stage where things really begin to fall apart. So this is something really important to believe that our beliefs oftentimes are so powerful, they can sh shatter the reality and can replace it with the alternative one. So this is something that oftentimes these Alzheimer patients get really misdiagnosed earlier in their career. So as I told you earlier that we have neuron to neuron connections and they form synapses. As you see in the middle here, these synapses really are the basis of communication between brain cells. If this falls apart, the brain actually becomes haywired. But then we also have glial cells which were thought to provide support earlier, but now we know that these glial cells are not just glue, but they are active participants in all brain communication and transmission. So to look at a little bit of overview of a synapsis, these are specialized structures. These are junctions between two brain cells. They are essential functional units of our brain. Their molecular um, composition really defines the synaptic function, whether they are excitatory, they are inhibitory, they are glutamatergic, GABAergic, serotonergic, or dopaminergic. Um, and then we have synaptic plasticity, which really changes to the molecular co composition of synapses, and it then will influence the synaptic function. And um, brain is very adaptive, and this really gives you uh, the functions of learning and memory. And if it is maladaptive, the synapses don't work. You have epilepsy, you have Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's, all, um, and you have schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. So to really look at the synapses, of course, you have tens of billions of brain cells. You cannot study them directly in the brain. So what we do is we can take these brain cells out. We grow them in cell culture. We now have only two or subsets of neurons. And then we can make either direct intracellular recordings from them and also can study them at the level of single neurons or single pairs of neurons. And what happens is that when you actually stimulate one particular neuron by firing an action potential, you will get excitatory postsynaptic potential in the connected cells. So you get one for one excitatory postsynaptic potential. But if you come and fire a burst, it's just like students studying, you know, um, cramming everything in one night, you fire it off a burst of spikes, you get a much bigger response, but then the, the subsequent spike or the action potential or the activity of the brain will elicit a very unique response whereby you get a much bigger response. The EPSP amplitude, what we call excitatory postsynaptic amplitude or the activity of that neuron is significantly augmented and then it really declines down and comes down to the baseline. So we call this working memory, short-term memory. Um, and this short-term memory forms the basis for our synaptic plasticity or relies on synaptic plasticity. But, but this is an important trait that is also affected in most patients who are suffering from Alzheimer's disease. So as I said earlier, that the genetic and environmental factor, they change our brain circuits all the time and throughout life. It's, it's not that once you reach a certain age that you cannot learn anything, you cannot refurbish, you cannot strengthen those synaptic connections. This is something that anybody who is really looking after these Alzheimer patients need to really pay attention to, that you need to really uh, make sure the synaptic connectivity and the brain connectivity is established and uh, maintained at that level. So here is a little video. Um, which will really give the summary of my rest of my talk. In healthy people, all sensations, movements, thoughts, memories, and feelings are the result of signals that pass through billions of nerve cells or neurons in the brain. Neurons constantly communicate with each other through electrical charges that travel down axons, 
causing the release of chemicals across tiny gaps to neighboring neurons. Other cells in the brain, such as astrocytes and microglia, clear away debris and help keep neurons healthy. In a person with Alzheimer's disease, the most basic form of dementia, toxic changes in the brain destroy this healthy balance. These changes may occur years, even decades, before the first signs of dementia. Researchers believe that this process involves two proteins, called beta amyloid and tau, which somehow become toxic to the brain. It appears that abnormal tau accumulates, eventually forming tangles inside neurons. And beta amyloid... Sorry about this. I think um, people are joining in late and so every time I try to admit them, it just... In healthy people, all sensations, movements, thoughts, memories, and feelings are the result of signals that pass through billions of nerve cells or neurons in the brain. Neurons constantly communicate with each other through electrical charges that travel down axons, causing the release of chemicals across tiny gaps to neighboring neurons. Other cells in the brain, such as astrocytes and microglia, clear away debris and help keep neurons healthy. In a person with Alzheimer's disease, the most basic form of dementia, toxic changes in the brain destroy this healthy balance. These changes may occur years, even decades, before the first signs of dementia. Researchers believe that this process involves two proteins, called beta amyloid and tau, which somehow become toxic to the brain. It appears that abnormal tau accumulates, eventually forming tangles inside neurons. And beta amyloid clumps into plaques, which slowly build up between neurons. As the level of amyloid reaches a tipping point, there is a rapid spread of tau throughout the brain. But tau and beta amyloid may not be the only factors involved in Alzheimer's. Other changes that affect the brain may also play a role over time. The vascular system may fail to deliver sufficient blood and nutrients to the brain. The brain may lack the glucose needed to power its activity. Chronic inflammation sets in as microglial cells fail to clear away debris and astrocytes react to distressed microglia. Eventually, neurons lose their ability to communicate. As neurons die, the brain shrinks, beginning in the hippocampus, a part of the brain important to learning and memory. People may begin to experience memory loss, impaired decision-making, and language problems. As more neurons die throughout the brain, a person with Alzheimer's gradually loses the ability to think remember, make decisions, and function independently. Achieving a deeper understanding of the molecular and cellular mechanisms and how they may interact is vital to the development of effective therapies. So it's really um, um, important, as I pointed out, that this is a one way to look at it most people have spent their lives and their careers really trying to bust these plaques, um, which they called, you know, either beta amyloid or tau protein. Um, billions of dollars have gone into clinical trials as well, but to no avail. Um, and, you know, oftentimes what really happens in the field is that we end up looking for our lost key in in the parking lot or in the park under the lamppost. It's because this is where the light is and not the key. So most of these research that has really been focused in trying to bust this is, and I'm going to actually bust that, that it's not really uh, the only cause or the main cause for Alzheimer disease. And yet I think there needs to be a narrative a change or a paradigm shift. So we need to really think in the darkness as to where, what are the causes for Alzheimer's disease. As we know that the current theories are that you have beta amyloid, um, uh, you know, um, hypothesis whereby 
the amyloid precursor protein is cleaved by gamma and, and beta uh, secretases. These are the enzymes. They release then the beta peptide and this beta peptide, which accumulates uh, to form these amyloid plaques. And these plaques are just like, imagine that you have a, in a highway and a traffic and all of a sudden somebody puts things on the main road to block it. And so people will have to drive around. And this is where actually these plaques, what they do is they try to shut down this highway in, in that sense. Um, and then when we think about, you know, from healthy to aging brain, we begin to see that in a brain of a Alzheimer patients begin to shrink considerably and particularly the areas that you can compare in terms of memory, which is the hippocampus is the one that undergoes severe and extensive degenerative processes. So Alzheimer's disease is one of the most common causes of dementia in among older adults, resulting in the loss of cognitive function, our thinking ability, our remembering and reasoning, as well as behavioral abilities as well. But recently we have also begun to really recognize that there are also young people at the age of 50, of 40, even 40, who are inflicted by um, you know, Al Alzheimer's. And often they are overlooked or misdiagnosed for one reason or the other, that they may have had concussion or other things. But you know, it's creeping in. This particular pandemic is really creeping in to affect those uh, just like COVID-19 did. It went from all the adults and the older ones and then slowly and gradually even children. Alzheimer's disease is actually no, no different in that context. So you have cognitive function, thinking and mem remembering, memory, reasoning, all of these aspects are, are really perturbed in that uh, particular case. And we know that you know Alzheimer's disease, it's a brain disorder. Um, which slowly destroys memory and our thinking capabilities and skills, and eventually the ability for us to really, um, you know, do simple, simplest tasks like paying your bills or even remembering to log on to your bank account and do these kinds of things. So we know that the memories are of uh, two types. You have uh, short-term memory, you have long-term memory, and I think, you know, it begins with the short-term memory but certain aspects of long-term memory are also affected. Um, and then you have long-term memory will also have both explicit, which is conscious, and then the implicit, which is unconscious. And as you know that the unconscious part of our brain scans 1.2 million frames per second, whereas the conscious part scans only 42 frames per second. So this is something that's really important to know the conscious and then the unconscious part, and then it determines your episodic, which is you know events that happen to you, or the semantic parts of the memory, which is journal knowledge of the world, what's going on around you. Um, and then when we think about the implicit, which is the unconscious memory, it's primary, and also it's a procedural, for example, motor movement that you often see are, are really altered or perturbed in Parkinsonian patients as well. So uh, why, why are we calling it a tsunami or why are we calling it really um, a pandemic? Why the choice of that topic? So we know that uh, Dr. Alzheimer's in 906, he noted changes in the brain, a tissue of a woman who had died of unusual mental illness. And people back then didn't know much about mental illnesses. Um, her symptoms included memory loss and language problems. Um, unpredictable behavior, you know, she will get angry, very fidgety, um, uncomfortable with certain people. After she died, you know, he had the opportunity to examine her brain and found many abnormal clumps. He found that the brain was really a mush at certain areas, which, you know, are now called as um, amyloid plaques and tangles, bundles of fibers. Now they call them neurofibrillary. Uh, tangles or tau tangles. So this is really the tangles where just like noodles and spaghetti, things really mush up and then you have hard time figuring it out or getting to the meatball that is in your plate as well. So causes of dementia can vary, depends on the type of the brain changes that may be uh, taking place. Um, some of them are Lewy body dementia, then you have uh, frontotemporal disorders, 
vascular dementia, as was shown in the video. It's common for people to have mixed dementia, where a number of these kinds of dementia or mental anomalies come to play an important role. Uh, uh, and oftentimes one would see too, um, even in the autopsy brain, we will see the Lewy body as well as the vascular dementia and sometimes you know, mixed dementia symptoms um, of these proteins or, or tau or tangles. The plaque and the tangles in the brains are still considered some of the most common features of the Alzheimer disease. Um, and, but, you know, we uh, personally in our lab, we thought that since none of these approaches to, to break down these plaques have really worked and uh, even the clinical trials up to the, you know, uh, never went through a phase three clinical trials, um, we may be barking at the law wrong tree. So we started to think out of the box and we thought because the actual learning and memory centers, which is hippocampus, is the one most affected. Um, is it possible that the actual uh, synaptic communication or communication which involves cholinergic pathway, acetylcholine, um, which is, plays a very important role in learning and memory and, and, and on all alum, animals, um, maybe that is really one of the, one of the area or one of the cause that may be affected. So the signs and sim symptoms, one looks at the memory uh, problems are typically one of the first signs of cognitive impairment, which is related to Alzheimer's. Some people with memory problems, they have a condition which is a mild cognitive impairment, which is the MCI. And people who have this um, memory problems, um, you know, then uh, normal for their age, but their symptoms do not interfere with their daily life. So they can really carry on they have an episode and, and it happens to all of us. We open the fridge and then we forget what was it that we came to get, right? So sometimes it happens to all of us. Um, the, and then you have movement difficulties and problems with the sense of smell and hearing um, have also been linked to these mild cognitive impairment. Older people with mild cognitive impairments, they are at greater risk for developing Alzheimer's but not all of them do so. Now, some may even revert to normal uh, cognition. And we've seen that happen to us also um, when we had brain fog during uh, COVID-19, whereby when we were completely isolated, our brain will have some kind of these uh, mixed symptoms um, where we thought that our cognitive impairment or judgment or learning and memory was somehow impaired. So the signs and symptoms one really digs deeper into. The first symptom of Alzheimer's, they vary from person to person. For many, a decline in non-memory aspect of cognition, such as they have hard time finding the words. You know, they can't really pick out or pluck words um, which are kind of fluttering around their wings like butterflies but they can't pinpoint them. And then you have vision and spatial um, issues with them. So it's oftentimes you will see a person lost in the, in the mall. I found actually an individual who I, uh, in the cold weather uh, was just wandering around an elderly gentleman. And I immediately knew that he has lost and he could not, I stopped and I asked him, he could not tell me where uh, he was going. And he just was wearing his jacket. He thought he was going for a walk in minus 20. And, and then they have impaired reasoning or judgment. It may signal the very early signs of the disease. The researchers are studying now biomarkers, for example, biological signs of disease. They are found in brain images. You can determine from cerebral spinal fluid and blood. And more recently, there are urine tests but there is some ethical uh, issues attached to it too. If you actually found a positive biomarkers in the urine of an individual and an insurance company is not going to insure you for longer term because you are vulnerable, or you can fall prey to Alzheimer's disease. Um, so, you know, a mild cognitive impairment and the connectivity, normal people um, may be at greater risk of Alzheimer's disease. More research is really needed uh, before these techniques can be used broadly and routinely um, to diagnose Alzheimer's, but the progress is really being made in terms of cracking and finding the early biomarkers 
for Alzheimer disease in addition to the signs and symptoms that one is sees in, for example, in the case of memory loss or cognitive function. So when we look at the stages of this disease, so you have mild Alzheimer disease, um, and as Alzheimer's worsens, people experience greater memory loss and other cognitive difficulties. Uh, its problems could be uh, wandering around, and this is the, what I saw in that individual, getting lost and trouble really handling um, um, you know, money or, and paying their own bills, uh, repeating questions. They will reiterate, regurgitate the same thing as, as if the record uh, you know, needle is stuck at one place. And, and, and really taking longer to complete normal daily tasks. Um, and then you will also have personality and behavioral changes. People are often diagnosed, diagnosed at this stage. And then you have a moderate Alzheimer's disease. At this stage, damage occurs in the areas of the brain that control language, reasoning, um, your conscious thoughts and sensory processing, such as the ability to correctly detect a smell or a sound or even uh, to recognize a picture that you show of a loved one who may not be around or passed away. Memory loss and confusion, they grow worse and people begin to have problems recognizing family and even friends. And in the end, it was really heartbreaking when my mother would, would misrecognize me or you know, um, not recognize me as her son. She thought I was you know, um, uh, a cousin or a relative or even uh, her husband. So they may be unable to learn new things. They carry out multiple multi-step tasks such as getting dressed up or coping with a new situation. So if you provide a caregiver uh, to such individuals, they just don't want to see them there and they will react to them and tell them to get her out of here. I don't want to deal with this. So it's really getting um, uh, used to a new situation is adaptive behavior is very hard. In addition, people at this stage may have hallucination. They have delusion and also paranoia. So you begin to really see that even though it's affecting a particular part of your brain, which is the learning and memory center, but because it is connected with the other parts of the brain um, and then the whole circuits begin to fall apart and goes haywire. When this, the Alzheimer disease gets really severe, ultimately plaques and the tangles they spread throughout the brain, brain tissue shrink significantly and people who have severe Alzheimer's um, and they cannot communicate are completely dependent on others for their care. Uh, and then near the end of life, the person may be in bed most or all of the time um, as the body begins to shut down. And it's really, really terrible and painful because as the first example I cited, when you walk in and the circuits begin to short circuit and, and they cannot really fathom. They may not be really feeling anxiety, panic or anything else, um, but they oftentimes, um, it is just like a short circuit that's really going haywire. So when you really look at, for example, Alzheimer's, the most really uh, you know, common aspect causes of dementia among older adults is a loss of cognitive function. We know thinking, remembering, and reasoning, and their behavioral abilities are the ones that are really perturbed. So we know that the hippocampus, which is really the nexus for learning and memory, it is really shrinks uh, significantly than the shrinkage of the cerebral cortex. And then you have these enlarged ventricles because the space is vacated. Um, so what really happens is that a process that started with these two or three proteins begin to really now causes a complete traffic jam in all communications uh, throughout the brain and different parts of different parts of the brain. Um, so one, one looks at the potential causes that could be, we know that age is a factor and the gender is a factor. Then you have genetic factors, sometimes infection, inflammation that I showed in the video, environmental factors, you know, obesity, and you have diabetes. And the lifestyle changes, the cardiovascular diseases and head injuries, they are all the contributing factors. And, and if you have one or two, it just exacerbates the entire situation quite um, incredibly. 
So what we wanted to really test was in our case was to think out of the box and ask the question, you know, about whether it is the, the disruption of neuronal communication, which involves acetylcholine, which is the main transmitter uh, for hippocampus dependent learning and memory and synaptic plasticity. And this is really where most drugs, initial drugs are given to patients who have dementia or started a cognitive decline, they will give them these vesicular acetylcholine transporter, um, you know, reuptake blockers so they can block these um, uh, reuptake of these, um, 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 you know, neurotransmitters, allowing it to stay in the terminal for a while. So of course you cannot do this in the intact brain. So we started out with really um, taking out hippocampal neurons, growing them in cell culture, and then imaging them and testing them at to um, what happens to cholinergic pathway um, uh, if it is perturbed. Um, so we came up actually serendipitously a, pro, a gene, which is MEN1. And this gene was actually a tumor suppressor gene and nobody knew what it does the function. We were the first to actually found that in cholinergic neurons, the postsynaptically, this particular gene or its, its protein, which is menin was significantly involved in cholinergic transmission. So what we went after it and we did you know, a series of experiments to knock out uh, this particular or block this particular gene and its function. And it turns out that it actually perturbs cholinergic synaptic transmission, whereby when a brain cells activity, when they are firing um, brain cells, they are active in doing cognitive function or physically, they allow calcium to enter inside the cell. This calcium then is binds to calpane, which is an enzyme. Calpane would then cleave menin into two component. One is what we call the C domain, which goes to the nerve terminal and it causes clustering of nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. And these receptors are really important players in learning a memory and learning a memory. The other part, which is n menin goes to the nucleus and it causes the transcription um, of nicotinic acetylcholine receptor proteins upregulates it. So if the activity is blocked, we get the whole process blocked. And we see the same thing actually happening in Alzheimer's as well, where the brain cells are not active or the activity is compromised, you will see that this particular nicotinic acetylcholine receptor function is compromised in those brains. So we went in and we um, used a genetic knockout because the knockout from men one which is actually a tumor suppressor, um, and it also taught us an important lesson, the genes are really playing multifaceted functions and um, not just affecting one particular area, but they are also involved and invoked to perform other functions. So we generated a conditional knockout because the actual knockout is lethal, the animal would die. We created an, um, a, a conditional knockout Allow the, allow the animals to uh, really grow up. And then we go in selectively um, and inject, um, you know, the, uh, we use a, a virus which will specifically impact the neurons that we have tagged, which are again, cholinergic neurons, the neurons that involve c menin functionality. And what we found was that these animals were um, really could not recognize or, or learn or, mem or memorize. And we use our chip to plant it inside the brain so we could monitor the behavior of these freely behaving animals. And we found that if we genetically or selectively or conditionally knock this gene out, which is involved in you know, uh, nicotinic acetylcholine receptor functionality, that these animals exhibited traits which were very similar to what one sees in an, um, in an Alzheimer model. So they really have learning and memory deficits they could not recognize and they could not also re react to um, a fear conditioning uh, paradigm. And then what we did was that we used the same um, viral vector approach to re-express that gene in the brain of these animals and what we did was that we actually recovered that loss of function, which was really remarkable. And the paper just came out in cells. It's one of the really, uh, you know, um, good journals in, in that sense. So 
Then we looked at really whether, and now this particular MEN1 tumor suppressor gene is present in human autopsy brains from patients who died of Alzheimer's disease. So uh, in our brain bank, we collected and we labeled these brain cells, uh, identified them, and we developed a novel technique whereby we could specifically use antibodies to label unique brain cells um, with exquisite accuracy in this case, this is a postsynaptic protein, which is really used in the human tissue. We then went in to look for localized nicotinic acetylcholine receptors in the human tissue in the hippocampus area. We, we nailed that as well. And then we asked whether in those areas, c is expressed in cortex or the hippocampus of these uh, uh, autopsied human brain tissue. And it turns out that indeed we can see c expressed not in all cells, but in a large number of those cells in an animal, in a human brain that uh, was identified as, uh, um, you know, um, Alzheimer's, um, uh, you know, died of Alzheimer's disease. And we also used control matched um, brains where we did not find this particular. And then we wanted to ask the question whether menin is now co-expressed with those proteins that have been touted to be the cause for Alzheimer's disease. So we then also stained uh, C-menin uh, in the human autopsy brain uh, and also the tau protein. And we often see co-localization uh, of tau protein in the aging brain. But interesting thing was that even if a person had died at the age of like, 60 or 70 and they did not have Alzheimer um, you know, markers, but we still found that in many cases, you will see tau that accumulates even in the normal brain. So that tells us that the process of these tau protein accumulation starts a little bit earlier in life. And then what we actually found was that c which is brown here, and the pink is the actual tau protein, they co-localize in most of, the, most of the cases. So we still try to make the case that it is actually maybe the c menin or menin related protein, which involves the disruption of synaptic communication between brain cells in the hippocampus is the first trigger that then subsequently trigger the accumulation of these proteins that are involved uh, are, are touted to be the main causes of Alzheimer's. So I think I, you know, um, what we need to be able to do in this particular case, it's really important for us to be able to look outside the box, because if we continue to look for the last keychain or under the lamppost, it may not be there. So I think it is time that we think about a paradigm shift in how we really uh, diagnose and, and find out that the how brain was put together and which particular protein or genes are important hallmarks and they play an important role, for example, in the manifestation of this new pandemic or the tsunami on the go. So I'd like to thank and be happy to take questions. Right, so, um, thank you very much, uh, Mashallah. Uh, again, a high-end presentation uh, as usual, uh, thought-provoking. Um, there are a number of questions. Uh, let me bring up the chat. Uh, obviously, some of them are bit uh, ethical, uh, and some of them are philosophical, but trying to keep it to the to the topic today. So, so the popular question is how uh, Alzheimer's can be delayed or prevented? So really a, a great question. Um, you know, the important thing really is, as I pointed out earlier intentionally, the brain cells that fire together, they wire together. To maintain that firing and wiring, you really need to make sure that the cognitive functions are maintained and, and the diet is healthy. So you eat healthy, you exercise uh, really well. So make sure that you supply enough blood to your brain so the brain cells and the networks stay together. The problem in our community is that once you retire and the retirement age in our countries is 60, you know, people are just then put on the side that all of a sudden you have served your purpose. The bicycle, bicycle is old now and the tires are flat and the puncture, put them in the garage and that's it. And I think that is really one of the major causes for is the cognitive decline. 
Um, and you can delay all of these processes by really engaging yourself in healthy mental activities and that. And we have also learned that the exercise plays a very important role. Physical activity allow you to be able to um, really um, have, um, for example, enough enrichment, trophic molecules supplied to your brain. We also know that the growth factor deficiency in the brain will allow these um, you know, um, manifestations, the ailments to come hold in your immune system. Also, I think uh, you know, um, healthy diet like the omega-369 eating fish, we know that the Japanese really rely quite extensively on fish. Um, and that also really is one of the things that will delay the cognitive decline as well. So I think one could keep the brain active and healthy um, physically as well, um, and, um, uh, and a good diets and really keeping brain engaged in mental activities, mental uh, parts of the functionality, um, you know, doing different kinds of things. A person who doesn't read is no better than person who cannot read. I think we begin to shut down, and as we shut down our brain functionality, I think um, you know we uh, make ourselves vulnerable to these diseases. Perfect, thank you. Um, I mean, this is this is my observation. Might be totally wrong. Do you think uh, that uh, there is a difference uh, of the culture? So, is it fair to say that uh, the Western cultures have? more of uh, this condition in form of this incidence compared to the Eastern culture, the social setup we have, what we eat and all that. So uh, again, great question. I was actually sharing a, a, a table with uh, 18 other, uh, my clinical department heads when I was a department head for uh, cell biology and anatomy. And they were all talking and they were saying that our healthcare system in North America, in Europe is so good that people are living long lives. And when they live long lives, they actually develop dementia, then they forget to die, right? So they continue to live for forever. Um, and so they looked at me and I said, we don't have those uh, kinds of neurodegenerative disorders and diseases in our community. And they were all surprised and says, is this Nihari? Is this the pie that you eat? Or is it the jalebis or gulab jamun? What is it? Can you tell us, you know, what is the secret for um, you guys not developing these neurodegenerative diseases and disorders? I said, well, not very many in my community live past 50. So, you know, uh, one uh -huh. way to over... The one way to overcome all of these manifestation is to maybe, you know, not live long. And I think it's poor quality of life and standard of living and it really stress and the environmental factors. Our age is really in Pakistan has declined continuously, uh, average being 60, whereas people here, I see, you know, at the age of 80 or 90, they're marrying for the 10th time. <laughs> so. <laughs> So, you know, they're, they're uh, happy uh, uh, and healthy in that context. I think this is where the manifestation shows up uh, so uh, prominently. Perfect. I think one more question there is uh, that why you are, what are the reasons you're calling it to be a pandemic in waiting? Why? So because, you know, the reason for this is that people are really living long lives and we have a you know, baby boomers now aging, right? And a huge cohort of population that is reaching that area whereby it will become, you know, um, a pandemic in a sense that not only the inflicted people are suffering, but the caregivers who look after these people will be equally mentally really challenged. And it may exacerbate their mental health and their, and their brain health as well. So I think with the time, it's the entire system that is going to begin to collapse. I think in the case of um, you know, um, brain and mental health related issues, it's often um, very difficult to really treat them. So in, in that sense, people uh, are just living um, you know, um, with the pandemic-like situation where we don't know what to do. Uh, we have no idea until we develop, for example, vaccines and slowly and gradually we begin to really ease all the restrictions. So, but the caregivers are just equally impacted because it's very difficult to manage those patients. But, you know, in North America and also I think in other countries, the aging population, 
the numbers are increasing incredibly. People are living longer lives. And so this really is the reason that the topic was chosen as the next pandemic. It's in the waiting. Thank you. Uh, there was another question about environmental pollution. Uh, and there are certain specific uh, chemicals. Uh, do you think there is an impact of that as well? Oh, absolutely. And I think these extrinsic factors, you know, the toxins, oftentimes they uh, render brain functionality compromised. You have lead, which can accumulate in the synaptic terminals and it blocks the synaptic connectivity. And once, as I showed you, when we knock down the tau protein, the MEN1 gene, the synaptic transmission begins to shut down. And as that begins to shut down, it's a really a, a tsunami or what we say is an avalanche of, uh, you know, um, comorbidity morbidity that comes back uh, to haunt the brain in that case. So the environmental factors, you know, um, diabetes, we talked about, in, um, you know, uh, even autoimmune diseases, infections, we have seen in people who were infected with the COVID and they had cytokine storms in their brain, which also really um, impacted the cognitive functions as well. Even if it structurally is not really perturbed or altered, one begins to see is that if brain network connectivity is not enriched, um, one begins to develop brain fog, even in the control brains as well. So I think you know, it, is, it is important uh, that all of these factors are the players from environmental, which is the extrinsic to epigenetic, as well as our lifestyle. Professor Naveed, can I ask one question? Um, sure. OK, I am Professor Mulazim Hassan Bukhari. Uh, first of all, I'm uh, thankful to you for this nice lecture. Uh, but one thing uh, uh, I can add, what is the difference this? Even this is the disease of the West. The same factor, the people are in diabetic, the people are in hypertensive, the people are autoimmune disorder in uh, East. But this disease is not so common. I will think, I think this, there may be some role in diet. That is the diet of the Eastern people are different as compared to the diet and living style of the Western people. Can you uh, add something or can you uh, explain it more on my idea or something? Will you agree? So, so I think we, we um, talked about this earlier. Um, the reason that you don't see it, So the absence of evidence is not the evidence for absence. So if it doesn't happen in Pakistan, it's actually not no, no, because- it doesn't it. The, uh, the frequency or the incidence, not in Pakistan, in the Eastern countries, uh, because I am myself a pathologist, I, I, the number of cases very rare as compared to West. Uh, that is why I think uh, there may be some uh, role of diet because the- Eastern diet is different as compared to the Western diet. Same as the prognosis of the corona and the incident of the corona was different in our country as compared to the, again, that was the role of the diet. So, you know, when you think about coronavirus, it's because, um, uh, well, again, in the West, it's very clean environment. We don't even get out, you know, um, eight months um, we have really clean water, clean, um, um, you know, um, air. And as a result, what happens in, in our situation is that the immune system is really weak. It gets bored and it starts to attack itself. And we often see that in, in you know, um, Alberta, my province is really world capital of, of um, MS. Um, psoriasis, um, we have dermatitis, we have many of these autoimmune diseases that are really much more prevalent than in, in Asia or in Pakistan. And Allah was kind to Pakistan because our immune system is really a red alert. And <laughs> it, it handled those little buggies when they attacked them really well, whereas we were caught by surprise. Um, so these little ababils brought down the elephants in the bigger countries. But I think Alhamdulillah, Pakistan was, uh, you know, suppressed. But, you know, going back to your question, it really is that in, because of the lack of proper medical attention and the diagnosis, 
it does, did, you know, any diseases, they do not get really picked. We also, um, you know, provide our um, uh, medical care is really not that. The other thing is that the age is really very short. Uh, life expectancy in our countries is much lower than what you see here. And this is a disease of uh, really old age. So the people, the longer they live and, and they have better diagnosis, and then the, the numbers and the statistics are really much more, um, I think, uh, easy to obtain here than in Pakistan. Naveed is Shabi here. Uh, there is this question that we, we do see elderly people of our stock, Eastern stock, like India, Pakistan, Iran, etc., living in the West. I know at least two or three people in our communities in the UK and USA who have developed dementia. So diet alone may not be the factor. It might be other factors, like external factors, genetic factors. However, one thing that I learned or uh, read many years ago was that is dry fruits that in northern Pakistan people consume a lot, like you know, uh, apricots and whatever. They do they have any factors which might be uh, delaying the process or controlling some proteins or something? You know, all these dry fruits. Which yeah, I think it's a really great question. Here um, as well, people are recommended omega-3, 6, and 9. And they are, you know, fish and then the nuts. Um, people who really need, and this is really the what we call fuel for the regenerative processes of brain cells. They need those trophic molecules, BDNF. And the precursor for many of those trophic factor is actually based on what is contained in these almonds or, you know, um, I brought uh, two sacks of chilgoza with me um, and it was really surprising to see how expensive they are. The sign outside said that, you know, um, your willingness or desire to obtain chilgoza these days is as if you are thinking of a second marriage. So, you know, it is just as hard <laughs> as hard, but I, I totally agree with you. I think this is something um, that we uh, constantly recommend people that they use, uh, you know, at least a fistful of nuts, not to really go nuts about the nuts and then uh, raise their cholesterol to a level where the coronary arteries and the heart begins to really falter. But, you know, and same thing is with Japanese as well. They eat lots of fish, which contains omega-3, 6, and 9, I think that's healthy. So diet plays a really an important role um, in, uh, in really delaying the onset. But as you pointed out, there are genetic factors. Some people may be predisposed to some components and elements of uh, this disease. Um, and sometimes it really could be concussion, vasculature, poor blood supply to brain, um, and stress as well. Right. Uh, so I don't know how much time is left, but uh, I'm not going to ask you this personal question. The, the, the scientists or neuroscientists like you who eat yourself to keep your mind for creative ideas. Uh, but in the end, I, I must, uh, uh, on behalf of uh, everybody, congratulate and thank you. Nadine, uh, can, can, you, can you allow Hussein to uh, he's, he's here yes, make us? Yes, he raised, he sent me a message that can I ask a question? He's a medical student. Sure. So we you, 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 uh, Hussein, are you there? Oh, uh, well, thank, thank you for the talk, first of all. Um, I really enjoyed it. It was a wonderful talk. Um, I'm a first year medical student in London at St. George's, and I've got a couple of questions. Uh, because, you can only answer if you have the time, sorry. Uh, no, firstly, um, what are your thoughts on assisted dying in advanced cases of Alzheimer's? Oh, <laughs> that is a multi, um, I think, faceted. It's a loaded question and mostly for an ethicist and really depends on um, um, uh, really the system and the country that you live in. I personally believe that the life is a gift of uh, God. And if these people are not really suffering in, in physical or pain ways, um, you know, eventually um, you have to, and it's a test. It's not the test for them. It's the test for caregivers, the loved ones. These people really serve the humanity, the community, the family, all their lives. And it is time for us to be kind, gracious and generous to them and help them really um, in, you know, go as far as they can go. 
and eventually, I think, you know, um, when the end comes, it, it really comes uh, that way. I will not be in favor of because, you know, they have sometimes good days and sometimes bad days. When there are good days, they are to cherish, they are to love, they are to really uh, be grateful because they hold uh, a tremendous link between our, our past and then continuum to future. Well, thank you. That was a wonderful answer. Very interesting. Uh, will I be able to ask another question as well? Go ahead, please. Um, so what would you say to a young person, say an early year medical student, who wants to get involved with research uh, in tackling this condition? What would you advise them to do? So, you know, again, um, uh, really a great question because, you know, don't study it for the sake of really um, uh, acquiring a stethoscope or a degree, because if you are not complete without a PhD or an MD, you will never be complete with it. You know, a prophet Isa, Jesus Christ, never went to medical school, but he could still heal and cure. So I think, you know, healing and curing is an important component of your profession. And if you think that the research can equip you better to be able to really understand the disease itself and to find cure for it, then you have just been a witness to a miracle performed um, you know, um, by a prophet um, that is inculcated in you uh, by the almighty. So I would really strongly encourage because those days are gone where you could just be a family physician or a doctor. I think that is gone where you need to really prepare, uh, prepare our, our generation um, to really think about this from a very different perspective. Unfortunately, you look at the neurodegenerative diseases, we can only manage them. We can't treat these patients. Um, so I think the treatment is a seeking treatment will only come from research and understanding the system much better. And inshallah, one day we will be able to allow them to live a healthy and a full life. Well, thank you again for that wonderful answer. And thank you for such a wonderful lecture as well. Thank, thank you, you. Sam. And may Allah bless you. And good luck with your studies. Uh, shukriya. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, uh, everybody would agree that knowing uh, your subject uh, or knowing science is one aspect, but to convey it is the other, and it's an art. And uh, we are very thankful, Professor Sayyid, for you. And I now uh, would uh, ask Professor Shabisa to conclude the session, please. Thank you, Nadeem. Um, well, obviously, as expected of Naveed, this was a superb lecture, thoroughbred research, things that we only dream of, ordinary clinicians like me, but this was really top range, superb research topic, wonderfully handled, and like you said, Nadeem, it's an art to speak. Naveed is not only, not only knowledgeable, but he also speaks so eloquently. It's a joy to listen. Every time you hear him, it's, it's really you want to hear him more. So obviously, on behalf of Saidic International Virtual University, not only would I thank him, but also invite him again, whenever he has the time to uh, give a talk once again. Also, we'll start working on a research project jointly. Naveed, under your guidance, we'll look for these various opportunities. And hopefully, in the next six months, we get the opportunity to come back. We can also, if you come to London, come over to London, come, come stay as Nadim is organizing a program with Vaji. When you, Vaji comes next time, maybe you should come over. Also, we have a live discussion and live debate like we once did two, three years ago. And then I'd like to thank all the participants who have come and spent um, literally a couple of hours um, listening to a maestro speak so eloquently. And thank you again, uh, Nadim, for your hosting and Naveed for your superb talk. Great so I'm your, I'm your humble servant. So thank you to both of you for your kindness, for your um, you know, graciousness, and also for the opportunity to speak to you. I am your humble servant anytime. Um, whatever I know, it's an incumbent upon me and mandatory to share my thoughts. So please forgive my shortcomings. Um, but inshallah, we will um, see you soon. Allah Hafiz. Thank you, and we'll leave the stop the meeting here. Thank you. This recording will be available on the CVU page and also IMI's uh, link, you know, the web page that is linked to CVU. Thank you. Thank you, and God bless.